I work in an organization across that $14 billion worth of spend. We have about 65,000 suppliers, which is a lot of suppliers. Technology 10 years from now will enable you to have 500,000 suppliers. So it's less about driving that supplier number down. It's how do you embrace technology such that you can interface with that 500,000 in a much more influential way. This is Radical Reinvention, a show by Zero 100 about reimagining the world's supply chains. I'm Mike Silverman, one-time would-be anthropologist, recovering management consultant, and currently research director here at Zero 100. If you've been listening to our show, you know why we started Zero 100, to push the world towards 0% carbon, 100% digitized supply chains. This means a world where supply chains power business efficiency, growth, and resilience, and where people's needs are met, but the planet is still preserved. To do that, we're working alongside the world's most innovative supply chain leaders, technologists, scientists, and academics to modernize supply chains through digitization. And we're inviting all of you along for the ride. Join us as we work to create more responsive, resilient, and responsible supply chains, one radical reinvention at a time. In today's episode, I'll be speaking with John Dixon, former chief procurement officer at AstraZeneca, the British and Swedish multinational pharma and biotech company. I was able to speak with John in one of his last weeks in the CPO role before he kicked off his retirement. There's a lot going on in supply chain right now, from global trade disruptions to automation and artificial intelligence. Next to those topics, procurement doesn't seem as exciting. My old boss, Scott Galloway, always gave career and investing advice that boring equals sexy. If that's the case, procurement is very, very sexy. But in all honesty, as the COVID pandemic shook global supply chains and woke up the business world and general public to the critical value of supply chain, procurement has also risen to shine as an integral part of the complex global supply chain that keeps our world humming. Procurement is the process of acquiring the goods and services needed to support a business. And the procurement practice has long been undervalued as just a way of saving costs with vendors. But procurement has been evolving to become a strategic edge for companies. The major shift was moving from standard contracts with suppliers to value-added partnerships. Unilever introduced their Partner to Win program back in 2011 to drive closer collaboration with its most strategic suppliers. Gannon launched its Partner for Growth program with similar ambitions. Today, the tasks of a strategic procurement function are balanced between cost management, value creation, and risk management, playing a key role in safeguarding the competitiveness of companies. Hi, John. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to have you on the show today. You're welcome, Mike. Thank you. Your career in procurement has spanned over 35 years across various industries. You've held procurement roles at numerous global companies, including GlaxoSmithKline, Diageo, Heinz, Rolls-Royce, BP, and Network Rail. And you're now currently the Chief Procurement Officer at AstraZeneca. Over the years, how has procurement most profoundly changed? I imagine it's very different from when you started out. Yeah, if I can remember that far back, Mike, I I would say in the day when I first stepped into into this function, it was more purchasing than it was procurement. So it was more about the process of buying than it was the more strategic aspects that you see procurement getting involved in today. It's definitely moved from from just doing a process driven activity to to be much more embedded and engaged in the organization. We've obviously seen the advent recently of sustainability uh, come to the fore, and procurement spe- um, spend a lot of time engaged in that activity. Certainly within our organization, within our industry, and uh, also the whole risk dimension. Obviously, through COVID, we had a. Uh, something come out of left field that we had to manage, which which meant that procurement within the organization had to come out of the shadows to a degree. Uh, but, you know, all those kind of major programs now fully engage with procurement. It's probably more broad in terms of how we get involved across the business than than we were when I started. So, yeah, it's it's more a procurement function than it is a purchasing process. How did you initially get into procurement? How did you start your career? Well, I was sponsored through my degree by the Yorkshire Electricity Board. So I'm from the north of England, and I was on a a graduate training scheme uh, that you see everywhere today. 
and I had to go through various functions within the business. I ended up in procurement or purchasing, as it was called, as I said. And I just loved it. I mean, it was like all these brown envelopes floating around where you kind of had a, an RFP uh, tender come back in and the, the kind of tension about which supplier was going to get the business. And you know, it wasn't just about the price, but that was a huge component of it. So that's how I got into... So I sponsored through my degree and they kind of gave me these intermittent slots in various functions and that was the one that stood out for me. That was where I wanted to ply my trade, as they say. So the function and role of procurement have changed a lot over the years. Have the skills required to be successful in procurement also changed? Yeah, most definitely. Again, if you think back to a process-driven activity, you could almost like do that from anywhere, and it was almost like hidden in the back office. Uh, whereas today, procurement's very much front and center, engaging with the business, really understanding the business requirements much deeper uh, and broader than we probably did you know, 40 years ago when I first came into the function. Influencing the identity of the function, the transparency of the function uh, is even more critical today uh, for organizations when you think about the, uh, the amount of third-party spend that organizations uh, commit to externally. You need to be able to manage that external supply network in the most efficient and effective way and drive as much value in all its forms, for the function to to maintain its stance within an organization. While you shared the changes you've seen in procurement, I imagine what hasn't changed is the importance of relationships and networks. Procurement connects internal groups and external suppliers. John, what do you think are the hallmarks of an impactful supplier engagement? Well, I think if, if we reflect on what made us successful as an organization throughout the COVID pandemic, we had a common goal. So, you know, within our organization, there was total alignment around what we were trying to do and achieve. Um, enabled us to, to do something in eight months, which normally takes six years to do. In order for us to be able to do that, we needed to engage with a blend of external partners and make sure that the internal organization wasn't drowning in hierarchy because we just didn't have the time. I think that was a real stepping stone for for us as a function because I think it enabled procurement to to step up um, in an incredibly visible way uh, to make sure that we were not just supporting the COVID uh, response, but also business as usual. Uh, because we kind of supply a broad range of medicines to patients. So whether you worked in operations, R&D, the commercial business, procurement functions, and, and, and the other enabling functions, you had to perform across the full range of the, of the AstraZeneca uh, business rather than just focusing purely on the COVID. Uh, vaccine. But, so that was successful for us. And uh, we reflect on that in terms of some of the key things we want to take forward and instill into our normal ways of working. It kind of showed the organization in a really positive light, our ability to do that, uh, for us to remove hierarchy, stay controlled in terms of the rigor around uh, some of the processes we need to uh, deploy against. But yeah, it was a successful outcome, but an incredibly testing time, as you would uh, imagine. We obviously had to uh, establish new supply chains externally. We took the stance through our partnership with Oxford University. This was a not-for-profit vaccine manufacturing activity, so we wanted to make sure that we were supporting countries at the low and the middle-income level, and we needed to make sure that our supply chains were robust And the supply chains were, as I said, a mix of our external partners and the the, uh, contract manufacturing organizations we partnered with, as well as our ability internally to to manage uh, our role within the supply chain in terms of packing formulation, making sure we got the product out, uh, logistics. So it was was such a, a collective effort across the organization. Have things returned to normal in procurement? Or is there a new normal that AstraZeneca is operating in today? I mean, we're an organization that's incredibly busy at the moment. So, you know, that that comes with the the commitment to uh, research and development and the science-led uh, stance that, that we have. We're a global organization. It's 
driven very much by servicing the patient uh, ultimately. So that hasn't changed. We have a very strong revenue trajectory ahead of us. We've got to be consistent. We've got to make sure that we don't drop the ball. Um, so the better you become, almost the pressure increases uh, to maintain that level and that standard. Given that you've worked in procurement across various industries, is there one industry where procurement is more fun or more challenging? Is procurement in pharmaceuticals harder than procurement at Rolls-Royce or Heinz, or are they relatively the same no matter the industry? One of the challenges in procurement is because everybody goes shopping on a Thursday night to the supermarket, they think they can do corporate procurement as well. And it's not quite as straightforward as that. Everybody wants the Amazon experience of procurement within the corporate setup, and that's very difficult when you think about payment terms, when you think about goods receipt notes and all this kind of stuff. It's not quite as straightforward as people would anticipate it. So there's a lot of complexity to it. Yeah, All the organizations I've worked with have a, a very high reputation for doing what they do very well. So yeah, I feel very honored to have worked for, for all of them. Reflecting on your career, is there a moment that stands out to you that really changed you as a leader? Through my career, I've had moments where they would classify themselves as the aha moment. It's interesting, when I look back to my Smith Klein Beecham days, so before GSK was formed uh, as a merged organization in 2001, I remember in the first couple of years there, I was offered a a chance to go and run the Crawley manufacturing site uh, from a procurement department point of view. And my boss, I remember the conversation with my boss where he was telling me what he wanted me to go and do. And it was a bit of a commute down to Crawley from where I lived. Uh, so I said, well, what's in it for me? And I was trying to be that young negotiator, trying to be smart, trying to get more money in my monthly pay packet. And uh, he just looked me square in the eye and he said, experience knowledge, understanding of the business, and it will stand you in great stead moving forward. So I always think back to that moment where when you're given an opportunity, seize the opportunity, don't always try and look for something um, that you're going to benefit from, and it's not always monetary. I wasn't earning a particularly good salary at the time. It was okay, but uh, it was nothing special. Uh, but I, I remember that that role and that activity made me a better leader because I was given that leadership opportunity of running the department down there in Crawley. So it allowed you to see the business upfront and personal. And there was no hiding place because you had to make sure you were, you were kind of supporting that facility and that factory. Some things that you might think are a little bit of a hardship, you know, if you can turn that into a positive opportunity and a positive experience, then in the long run, you'll learn a tremendous amount about yourself and the job you have to do. That's great. I really like that response. Looking back on your career, is there anything you would have done differently? In terms of my career, things that I would have done differently, I'd have probably been a little more, more patient uh, with myself because I was in a procurement function that was kind of growing in terms of its importance to business. And I just wanted to be you know, involved at the strategic level, at the leadership level, at the top level. There's nothing wrong with having ambition and aspiration. Things come if you have the right work ethic and you put the right effort in, if you're willing to listen um, and drive yourself hard and, and have high standards, then it will come naturally. You don't have to always have it tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Now that we're in this post-COVID era, what are some of the challenges that the pharma industry faces? Ironically, COVID almost like raised an expectation of, of the pace at which you bring new medicines to market. We kind of almost appreciated as we were going that, you know, the level of expectation could potentially be increased as a result of us doing something far quicker than normal. You know, in the pharmaceutical sector, you know, products that make it through quite a long development cycle could fall over at any time. So you do have quite a high 
failure rate throughout the pipeline in the industry. We're positive and pleased about the state of our pipeline. It's broad from a therapeutic area perspective. It's It's got good balance from a timing point of view in terms of the various phases that you have uh, in that cycle. But that's a challenge in the pharma world, how quickly you can get a product to market. And those failures are very costly because it takes, you know, sometimes it can take 10 years, 12 years to develop a product. And the patent clock means you only have a number of years to be able to generate revenue to almost like pay for the development. Sometimes there's a little bit of a lack of appreciation of, of some of that cost dynamic. Uh, so so that's huge. Obviously, you know, pricing across the globe for medicines is a challenge for the industry, always has been. Uh, so that price pressure is something that we live with every day. And then when you reflect on procurement, because procurement spend a lot of time negotiating on cost of goods and all the indirects that we spend. So we spend around $14 billion uh, with the external supply network. You need to manage that very carefully uh, so the costs don't escalate and spiral away from you. We're obviously in quite a, a challenging environment right now with inflation across the globe. Uh, with the geopolitical situation uh, between Russia and Ukraine adding pressure as well, energy prices, etc. So there's a lot of individual challenges, but that's ultimately what procurement are in existence for. It gives us an even greater op- opportunity to, to to increase our visibility and be valued of what we bring uh, to the organization. Through your career, how have digital solutions changed the procurement job and the procurement function? Yeah, I mean, uh, life has generally changed, hasn't it? 40 years ago, I didn't have a mobile phone. It's just a totally different environment, the way we analyze data today. Uh, We have more at our fingertips than we ever dreamed of having back in those days. The processes are much slicker, much more efficient, much more effective. From a clinical trial point of view, how do we put some of the monitoring in the hands of the patient? You know, because a patient wants to take control much more of of their care. So, you know, wearable devices, all this kind of thing is just something that you wouldn't have have had uh, back in the day. How we manufacture product, you know, continuous direct compression of tablets, for instance. Those process technologies have evolved over time and they rely... Uh, heavily on us, you know, managing the whole footprint of our manufacturing facilities. You know, the the smaller we can get them, the more effective we can get them uh, through the through the advent of technologies. The factory of the future is going to look very different to what it was forty years ago. Speaking of the future, how do you see procurement changing in the next ten years? Are the biggest impacts going to be digital technologies, global tensions, R and D innovation? I think all of the above data and technology will have a huge impact on process throughput time. It will have more kind of influence on the data and the analytics of data for you to make better decisions. How you interpret that data and manage that data will be critical for many. For years, procurement have been obsessed with the number of suppliers they have. So I I work in an organization across that $14 billion worth of spend. We have about 65,000 suppliers, which is a lot of suppliers. Technology 10 years from now will enable you to have 500,000 suppliers, right? So it's less about driving that supplier number down. It's how do you embrace technology such that you can interface with that 500,000 in a much more influential way using the technology. I think autonomous procurement where you put more in the hands of the user. Today, that's a slightly difficult conversation to have because the assumption is you're passing work to somebody else. Whereas actually, again, if you drive technology solutions, a lot of that autonomous procurement or self-serve, whatever you want to call it, will, I think, come to the fore. Ten years from now, you're going to be assessing the the kind of sustainability agenda in a, in a probably in a different way. That, that's what I would hope is different uh, in 10 years, that we've kind of broken the back of the challenge, that we know how to, to manage uh, all elements of sustainability. That's going to be a combination of technology, it's going to be a combination of mindset, and it's going to be a combination of more collaborative partnering. I hear you on that point. The digital transformation happening in supply chain today really has the capability to handle more complexity in the supply chain, allows us to better collaborate with partners, and ideally we can unlock better operations as well as more sustainable operations. 
In Zero 100's research report, Carbon Through a Supply Chain Lens, we've calculated that sourcing represents a whopping 32% of total annual greenhouse gas emissions. Given this massive slice of the pie, sourcing and procurement have a big job to do to increase visibility with suppliers and find solutions to reduce their supply chain's carbon footprint. In January of 2020, AstraZeneca set ambitious zero carbon targets. By 2025, the goal is to eliminate all emissions. And by 2030, the goal is to be carbon negative across the entire value chain. How is that program going? And how is procurement contributing to those goals? Fortunately for me, I work for an organization whose senior executive team, including the chief executive, are very vested in in what we're doing from a sustainability point of view. So we realize that our ambition out to 2030 around carbon negativity is probably one of the most demanding relative to to a number of industries, uh, but certainly within the pharmaceutical industry. So we are leading the way, if you like, uh, in that space. And the fact it's challenging doesn't mean you have to soften the target. We know we have a challenge. We're obviously working very hard on scope one and scope two today, but we're also working on scope three. So what we can't afford to do is wait until 2028 and then start to get our head around how we're going to drive scope three uh, emissions in the organization and in the external supply network. A large proportion of our emissions sit in our external network, as you would expect. The challenge we have is because we're quite ambitious and a lot of the pharma industry use the same supply base. So what we've done and continue to do is work very hard across the industry in a collaborative fashion. And that's probably something that we haven't necessarily always done historically as an industry. It's absolutely the right thing for us to do. That's great. Within our Zero 100 community of supply chain leaders, we're actually having a lot of conversations about collaborative efforts. You know, having the goal of making faster and more impactful changes to reduce the carbon footprints of our operations. Yeah, and I think we've been talking about this for a long time, right? People who complain about, you know, it's quite a tight timeline to 2030. Well, this shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. We've been talking about this for ages. Oh, we should seek as high a level of impact as possible. Our intention is to get there. It's all for that common good at the end of the day. Absolutely. So I hear you're about to retire. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Any fun plans for retirement? (laughs) Well, initially heading off to Vietnam. So I'm going to Vietnam for three weeks, which I'm so looking forward to. It's been on my bucket list for a long time. We've got the Formula One Grand Prix, four days, which will be nice. And then we're going out to the Seychelles in September. But I'm taking my children with me. For the last time, so after that, there's no more payment of holidays for my children. So, <laughs> It sounds like an amazing way to celebrate the milestone. Reflecting back on your career in procurement, what stood out to you? What have you enjoyed the most? Well, I've been blessed to work with some incredibly talented procurement professionals. A lot of people talk to me about how hard has it been to stay in one function for, for the whole of your career. And it's not without the the want of trying from some to try and get me out of the function, but it's just something I've always, I've just loved my time in procurement. I've been blessed to work with some incredible companies. As I said, some fantastic individuals, but I feel incredibly privileged to have worked for for procurement across the organizations I have. That's great. What advice would you give to someone either starting their career out in procurement or someone with the goal of becoming CPO? Get to know your business. Because procurement can't operate in isolation of the business, so get to know the business you are supporting. Be open to an experience of lifelong learning. So be curious, ask questions. That discretionary learning is quite important. It's not people being forced into a training room and being told to learn things. Read, get to know digital and technology in particular. The more you know about that, the more you can interface and the more you can influence within your businesses. Uh, But if you have no connectivity to to what your business does and what the challenges and drivers are with your business stakeholders, then you won't be as successful as you could be. I hear you on that. 
There have been some great moments. So I've had a, I've had a great time. I've loved every moment of it, even the moments when uh, your budgets have been questioned or your savings delivery isn't quite enough. Even those moments you can take learnings from, right? Yeah, that's great advice. John, thank you so much for joining me today. I really enjoyed the conversation with you. Me too, Mike. Thanks. They say that hindsight is twenty twenty, which is why I'm so grateful that John was able to join our podcast and reflect on his career and procurement's important role in helping evolve supply chains to be resilient, responsive, and responsible. This episode of Radical Reinvention was produced by Brian Egan, Catherine Perry, Ursulan Khan, Duda Rodriguez, and me, Mike Silverman. Ko Takasuki Chernovin composed our theme music. To find out more about Zero 100 and to check out our content library, go to zero 100 Com. If you're interested in joining our community of contributors, send us a note at hello at 0100.com. 